Welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and here with me is Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature and works with the Penn Translation Committee. She and I are co organizers of Translating the Future, the conference you are attending. Thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for week 18 of Translating the Future. Today's conversation on translating trauma features Ellen Elias Brusuk, translator and author of a book on her work at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, writer and editor Aaron Robertson, who translates from Italian, and Julia Sanchez, who translates from Portuguese, Spanish, French, and Catalan. Our moderator, Queenie Sukadia, is a scholar of global human rights literature at the CUNY Graduate Center. You can learn more about all of our to all of today's highly accomplished speakers by reading their full bios on the Center for the Humanities site. In her extraordinary 2016 essay, War in Translation, Lena Munzer, who participated in week two of this conference, describes her experience translating Syrian women's accounts of their lives under war and siege, stories so harrowing that to translate them was itself a trauma. There is a violence in undoing someone's words and reconstituting them in a vocabulary foreign to them, a vocabulary of your own choosing, Munzer writes. There is a violence too in the way you are for long moments, annihilated by the other, undone in return. Neither the translator nor the text emerges from the act unscathed. Today's guest believers in the powers of documentation will talk about how they have risked that violence, that annihilation by the trauma of the other, to become part of an act of bearing witness. Freedom of expression is one of the pillars of PEN America's mission, and I'd like to point out that the works that Aaron and Julia will be discussing today, Beyond Babylon by Ijiaba Shago and Slash and Burn by Claudia Hernandez, were both awarded grants from the Penheim Translation Fund. It's so important to see works such as these supported by the publishing community here. As usual, please email your questions for Ellen, Aaron, Julia, and Queenie to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you know it in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future will continue in its current form for one more week. Beginning September 22, the conference finale in week 20 will feature a number of evening events with speakers to include Kate Briggs, Tracy K. Smith, Natalie Diaz, Ken Liu, Jennifer Croft, and a host of others. You can find out more on the Center for the Humanities website. We'll be back again on September 15, next week, with week 19 of our hour-long Tuesday events. Please join us then at noon Eastern Standard Time for a conversation on activist translation with Anton Herr, zooming in from Seoul, J.D. Plucker, and Sevinj Turkham. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest for in, in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lockman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. If you know anyone who is unable to join us for today's live stream, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Queenie and the others, We'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America, and to the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now over to Queenie. Hi everyone. So before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you for tuning in to what I expect to be a very generative conversation today. 
Um, thank you to our participants, Ellen, Julia, and Aaron for speaking with us today. And a big thank you to Allison and Esther, as well as our sponsors for creating a space for us to have these rich hour long conversations. Um, so to kick, to kick off today's discussion, I'd like to ask you, Ellen, Aaron, and Julia to situate us with respect to your work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your projects themselves and then also your journeys be they intellectual, biographical, or linguistic, that led you to undertake this work of translating trauma. So Aaron, why don't you start us off? Yeah, sure. So I am talking about uh, Ijiaba Shago's novel, Beyond Babylon. And she, uh, Ijiaba is a Somali Italian writer. Mm -hmm. She's writing in Italian. And this is a novel that is set in multiple nations. So uh, Italy, Argentina, Somalia and um, uh, Tunisia. And it's essentially about um, the legacies of Italian uh, uh, colonialism um, throughout all of these nations. And so the novel kind of tracks the, the stories of five characters. Um, the two main protagonists are half sisters who go to Tunis um, to participate in an Arabic language program. So it's a novel about uh, kind of inter, uh, intergenerational migration. It's about language learning uh, and the actual process of translation. And in um, many ways that we'll probably talk about here, it is about the traumas that are uh, sustained on both in individual and national scale. Julia, how about you? Um, I'll be talking about um, Slash and Burn, which hasn't been published in English yet. I have the Spanish copy here. Um, it's by Claudia Hernandez, who is a Salvadoran, a contemporary Salvadoran writer. Um, this is her first novel. She's mostly written short stories until now. And it follows several characters. There's one sort of main woman um, that it revolves around. She is unnamed and she lives in an unnamed country during a civil war and also in the aftermath of the war. Mm -hmm. And it also tells a story of her daughters and essentially how she's trying to bring up her daughters to have a respectable, well, not respectable, but just like a, a happy, not happy, fulfilled something life. I'm trying to not like project all these uh, Western concepts of productivity to these people. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I remember speaking to Claudia a while ago and she apparently had thought of it as a film. She'd been interested in writing screenplays and had wanted to make a movie about this more in the vein of a documentary and it hadn't quite worked for her and so what we have is a very oral history of the of the, the civil war period and the post-war period of a place that what we assume is El Salvador but could be any other place in Latin America where a proxy war was fought. Mm -hmm. Ellen? Well, I, I uh, lived in what was then Yugoslavia for a long time. Uh, I, I come from the States, but I married there, had my kids there, worked as a community translator for a, a total of some 18 years. And then, why is it echoing all of a sudden? Um, and then and then moved to, back to my local, to my where I'm from, which is Boston uh, in 1990. And then the war broke out and here I was. Uh, so ever since then, since really 1990, I've been translating people's writing about those wars that went on in uh, in what became all the successor countries after mm -hmm. Yugoslavia broke up. And, and so in terms of trauma and translation, almost everything I've translated has had some resonance with that, except the most recent writing or the very early things I did before the war began. But I chose for today this Snowman by David Albahari which shows a glass of orange juice on the cover. And that's his one comfort as he's in this strange city in Canada, he clings to his glasses of orange juice that will somehow get him through the worst of times. And, and uh, it's, it's an amazing book. And probably of all the ones that I, the novels that I've translated about war, it goes the most deeply into personal trauma and loss, uh, just directly into it, just to, and uh, 
And so I thought of it as, as what to share with Julia and Aaron before and Queenie before we started. And then just briefly, the other thing that I've done that has to do with trauma and translation is I worked at the war crimes at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia for six years in the translation unit, and then wrote a book about that and was able to survey my colleagues about their experiences of trauma and bias and all those things we talk about. Uh, and so that helped me articulate some of my own thinking about about translators and how they relate to those things. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating. Um, so personally, I've always kind of been interested in thinking about how we receive narratives of trauma and then also how we transmit them forward, which is what each one of you seems to be doing through the act of translation. Um, so I'm curious about how you position yourselves with respect to these texts that you were working with um, as both individuals are receiving these narratives and then also stepping into the shoes of these writers to do this work of translation. Um, and I'm particularly thinking here about the risk of appropriation that kind of attends this work of translation. Uh, but I'd also like to hear you speak more generally to any of the eth ethical dilemmas that you may have faced um, in kind of doing this work of translation and how you've worked through them. Um, Julia, oh, can you okay. start us off? Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about my position as a translator with respect to any text that I translate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very helpful to imagine the translator as a, a close reader rather than as a proxy for the author. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, what you have to work with is the text that they have produced. You don't have the background information. You don't have their research. You don't have whatever context that they were in when they were um, working on that. Mm -hmm. So I found out, again, um, after translating this book from someone else who had met the author that she based this book on like a decade's worth of interviews. I don't have access to these interviews. I don't know how she ended up um, bringing them together to create this narrative. If there was one person whose story she followed or if the protagonist is actually a mix of all these um, different narratives. I was also hesitant to ask too much of the author because I know that she wrote this at a, in a, during a period of exile. She was born in 1974, so she would have, and the, El, the, the, war, the civil war in El Salvador started in 1979 and ended in 1992. Um, so she would have been four years old to 15, 16, I, don't, I can't math, but something around that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel it was my place to make her bring up any possible trauma that she might have experienced. So as I said, I think in an email, I, I read around I read around this book, which is what I always try to do when there's a time um, for some of the vocabulary that has to do with like the guerrillas um, and some of the politics, because there are very specific terms that have been used internationally. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I just sort of wrestled very closely with the, t the, the information I had. Um, I tried to identify the mood of the writing, like what it was trying to convey um, through its word choice. It's, it sits at this very interesting um, intersection between an oral mode and also, um, you know, this is going to sound obvious, but prose, like literature. So um, the grammar is always correct, but it's always very... Um, plainly styled and it feels like someone could be saying these things um, the whole time. Um, so yeah, I guess that's where I positioned myself. Don't know if that- Great answers. to hear. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear. Um, Aaron or Ellen, whoever thinks. Sure. Aaron. <laughs> there's me, yeah. So, uh, so this was a book that I translated um, in, in 2017. Uh, and this was something like that I came to during college. So it was my first translation project. I had no kind of, uh, no plans of becoming an actual translator. Um, but I had learned of Ijiaba's nonfiction and, and journalism. And she wrote a lot about um, uh, you know, racism in, in modern day Italy and kind of uh, how, um, how you could trace that 
to a certain extent uh, back to uh, you know Italy's colonial projects in North Africa and the the Horn of Africa. So uh, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Libya. Um, so one one quality of this book, which uh, which focuses on five you know separate narratives, is that you always have characters who are leaving a place and then reflecting on what it means to leave and to arrive. Mm -hmm. In 2016, one of the reasons I wanted to study abroad in Italy, but but frankly, you know, anywhere, was that I was still was still thinking of Michael Brown and the start of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014. And I was trying to, to get a sense of my own place, uh, like in this movement, what did I want to contribute? What did I think I could contribute? I didn't know the answer really, um, but kind of inspired by, by James Baldwin, you know, who, who went to France and was always kind of thinking about, well, what does, what does the, you know, situation in Algiers have to say about what's happening in Harlem? I wondered uh, what in Bologna or Rome or Florence could I learn about what's happening in the US, you know? And so I encountered this book um, somewhat randomly in a library. I knew her name, like I said, but I didn't know much about her, her fiction. So I, I read this book and I hear all these echoes of Toni Morrison in it. And she is very explicitly engaging with Toni Morrison. And so you have all this crosstalk across boundaries already, across you know, literary texts. And when I saw the ways in which she was engaging with, with trauma itself, with the use of the color red, uh, um, uh, like in this book, I said, well, that's my permission maybe. That's that's my way in because Ijiaba is very conscious of um, the the kind of you know African American uh, uh, literary tradition too, and so I saw it not as a way to um, to stake a claim on the text, but to engage uh, like in an actual conversation with Ijiaba. And nowadays, I'm fortunate enough to actually talk to her about what's going on in Italy, what's going on. Here in the states, um, so that's how I came to her work. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, as far as I'm concerned, when I was leaving Yugoslavia in the late '80s, I got in touch with David Al Bahari because I was really interested in his distinctive postmodern approach to literature, and I, I really liked his stories, and I ended up translating a collection of them for Northwestern University Press in the early 90s. And then he moved to Canada uh, in, the, in about 93 or 94 and started writing. He, he left, that was right in the middle of the war going on. And the war went on for the, the, the greatest intensity of the ground fighting was between 91 and 95. And so he left right in the middle of that and went to Canada as a writer in residence and various other capacities there. And, and uh, when he first sent me Snowman, he wanted me to translate it and I read it. <clears throat> and I was so devastated by it. It was so painful and I was still so much in my own losses that came out of the war that it was very hard for me. And I wrote back and said, I just don't think I have the, the courage and the strength to translate this, it's too hard. And he wrote back and said, oh, try, please try. And when I sat down and started to my surprise, which I hadn't even, it's not that I hadn't noticed it, but it, it's so different when you start to translate, you get so much deeper into a text that this whole novel is just completely, uh, full of this bizarre manic humor that he uses, he kind of, he builds the humor and the, and the despair sort of running along in parallel and he's dipping back and forth between them in this mm -hmm. very intense, very compelling way. And that's, I was only able to translate it because I sort of attached myself to the humor and the humor took me through it and, and uh, made it possible to, face and deal with some of the other parts that were uh, that were harder, the sense of loss and, and that to deal with in the novel. Um, 
And, and what I've found in general in translating, and I thought about a lot when I was reading Julia's and Aaron's translations, is that when a novel grapples directly with deeply traumatic subject matter, it's never superficial. It's always very intense. And the intensity may manifest itself in all sorts of different ways. But I find that no matter how difficult it is, if I can connect to that intensity, I can translate it. So that to respond to your... Yeah, that's really helpful to think about kind of narratives of trauma. Thank you. Um, and kind of to pivot to thinking about the concept of translation more broadly, and I think Erin, you touched on this a little bit in your response. Um, I'm wondering about kind of translation across time and space, right? Um, and how do you think, all of you, right? How do you think kind of trauma gets translated across generational and geographic boundaries in each of your texts, but even beyond them? Uh, or do you think that trauma traumatic experiences are kind of so localized and specific that they kind of resist translation across contexts? So do you think that trauma can be translated in these ways? So Ellen, can you start? Oh, off? yes, I think so. I mean, I think any huge emotions come across. I find when I'm translating that once a text becomes deeply emotional, that it moves me along. I, I don't, obviously there's work to be done with, with revising and thinking about holding the work of literature mm -hmm. together, but, but the sort of moments, the motor of the emotional content is, is mm -hmm. always, it all, all of us have experienced trauma at one level or another. We can recognize that even if it's what it was like when you started first grade. I mean, everybody has some kind of, has some kind of experience like that. I think it's, it's universal. That's my, anyway, that's the way I. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, can, do you have any input on this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so um, like I said, like this is a book that, that, that deals with multiple kind of manifestations of colonial violence. And so one, one character like in the book, her name is uh, Miranda and she is a poet uh, from Argentina. And her work is uh, almost, it, it is, it's pretty much like all about the the, um, the kind of uh, you know military uh, uh, dictatorship that Argentina experienced, like in the 1970s. Um, she is one of the lucky ones, and she's able to actually leave the country, relocate um, to Rome. But she's always thinking about los los desaparecidos, uh, you know, those who are uh, who are you know disappeared as a result, you know, often of, of state violence. And so Miranda arrives in Italy, this, this country that has deep, you know, cultural historical ties to Argentina. And um, what's, what's fascinating, uh, like one thing that is not mentioned explicitly like in the text, but is uh, which kind of, um, you know, underwrites this whole project is that Mussolini, you know, saw um, saw Argentina as a possible, uh, you know, bastion of uh, of fascism, uh, like in South America, right? And so mm -hmm. you have these ideologies that um, that really do, uh, uh, you know, transcend place um, and transcend time too. And the characters throughout this book, they are constantly wow. reflecting on the kind of scars, um, mostly uh, uh, um, that their mothers uh, inherit because four, uh, four of the five like main characters are women, two daughters, their mothers and um, their father. And so, uh, so families are, are, are kind of always uh, reflecting on how their past has kind of informed their own, uh, you know, messy uh, interactions often, and mm -hmm. um, something that you know that that I think Ijiaba does, uh, which Claudia does too, um, um, translated so well by Julia, is um, she really hones in on the the kind of complicated relationship between mothers and daughters. Um, like at a certain point, you don't really forget about the wars, like in the violence, but you you have to focus on um, your own life and maintaining your own household, right? Uh, you can 
you can look at your scars and you can blame them, but at the end of the day, your daughter needs needs you as a mother, right? She doesn't want kind of this weight of of uh, you know history uh, bearing down on her. So that like that, I think, is one of the really interesting dynamics of both Ijiaba and and Claudia's novels. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this applies less to Snowman, though of course the experience of, of that, you know, that post-war, maybe possibly even shell shock that the protagonist is experiencing when he goes to Canada can apply to a lot of different European countries, you know, since Europe has been like carved up and um, in the last 150 years. Um, but I think there's a, there's a stronger connection between Beyond Babylon and Slash and Burn in the sense that the two books, um, well, Beyond Babylon talks about colonialism and it's hard to find a nation on this planet that hasn't experienced some form of colonialism. So like that in a way is, of it is a narrative that I don't like the expression travels well, but it's one that is easy to um, to relate to across borders. And so Slash and Burn is, I've already said this, but I'll repeat it. Um, none of the characters are named. There's only one place that's named that is Paris, France. And it looms like very large in the protagonist's imagination because during the civil war, she um, gets pregnant and her child is taken from her and sold for the cause by some nuns to a family in France. So right there, you're already extending the web of um, the aftermath of this, uh, um, this experience of war. And then you also have characters who um, flee for that Northern country that doesn't get named, which is obviously the United States. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I believe she doesn't name anyone is because it, it universalizes the experience more. The book was first published in Colombia, and which is almost perfect because they, there's a similar um, experience of you know neighbors fighting each other and that ended much more recently. Um, and also there's the, the, the sexual violence that a lot of the characters encounter um, from childhood onward. Mm -hmm. And that is also sadly um, the kind of trauma that translates mm -hmm. across humanity. Um, I, I kept seeing so many parallels between uh, Beyond Babylon and Slash and Burn because of um, this, mm -hmm. you know, passing down the story. The protagonist in Slash and Burn tells her daughters about her experiences over and over to the point that the daughters are like, Ugh. I'm not, like I'm 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 sick of seeing, of hearing about the war, right. um, but one of the one of the things you learn at the end of the book is that for her the war never ended. Yeah. She's still in a constant state of 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 crisis, mm. even if it's quite um, muted. Mm. Yeah, and 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 can I add that you know what's uh, so one part about slash and burn uh, there's. There's one line, and and I'm, uh, you know, badly paraphrasing here, but Claudia writes about names, and she, she basically says that names are are you know for the dead. So, so what's the point really, right? And this idea that um, naming makes it easier to kind of identify and you know fix one person almost, one um, uh, identity. Uh, but obviously when you sustain some horrible trauma uh, that becomes troubled. And that's something that you also see uh, in Snowman too. You have this, this really neurotic, you know, uh, narrator who, who constantly is like, I, I feel like I'm living multiple lives almost or like there are multiple selves here. And he, you know, uh, keeps saying that uh, like here in Canada, I'm gonna grow old, but, but I heard someone say that. And then, you know, a few pages down, once again, he says, I feel like I'm going to grow old here, but he doesn't like really have a sense that it's just this one person saying this, right? And so the, the way that 
that trauma, I think, troubles a sense of location, not only, uh, you know, um, geographically and temporally, but for the, like for the individual, it's hard to, to really take stock of yourself to kind of contain yourself in um, one, one place in time. Also, there's an interesting connection between slash and burn and, and, and uh, very striking connection between slash and burn and snowman, which is that the lack of names. I mean, there isn't, he never even says where he's, he's surviving him. He doesn't say what the protagonist doesn't give a name. The only name that's offered to us is a dog named Freddy. And he then <laughs> says that he always calls dogs Freddy. So it doesn't even make specific that one dog. Uh, but, but again, it's a universalizing moment, as you said, Julia, that, 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 that having, having people are named by their categories, like the professor of political science or the mm -hmm. secretary or whatever, and, but, never, but never named. And it, it's, it's interesting. I just found that very interesting, that comparison. And also with, with Beyond Babylon, at the beginning, even though there are the five narrators, I had to spend some time to sort of work out. And some of them have similar names and that got confusing with Miriam and whatever, all the different names. So I was kind of working on, on names there as well. It was interesting. And also the geography is all three books are all about geography. And again, it's movement and, and uh, people uh, who are refugees or, or displaced and, and, and beyond Babylon's astonishing the way it moves among three continents and, and, uh, and, and then as you said, between Paris and Salvador and the United States. And in my case, the protagonist gets into this uh, kind of a wrestling match with all these maps that he's hung on the wall and he's thinking about borders and drawing them in on the maps. And it becomes this huge obsession with borders and geography and places. And so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, I'm also kind of curious about what you think about the relationship between language and trauma. Uh, because so many people talk about how trauma is essentially unrepresentable, but we find the representations of trauma like proliferating in all kinds of art, right? So how do you kind of make sense of this seeming paradox? Like, do you think that um, trauma, like what do you think are the strategies writers often rely on to make kind of trauma, which is so unrepresentable, representable? Mm. Well, I can start. Um, yeah. Uh, so like I, I kind of mentioned earlier that, that one of the tools Ijiaba uses to kind of, you know, trace the, um, trace different manifestations uh, like of trauma is color. So, uh, you know, um, in the beginning of the book, the, uh, one of the main characters uh, describes her, um, her rape as a child. Um, she was in, in school and the school janitor uh, assaulted her. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, um, like over time, she begins to lose the ability to actually see colors, right? So at the start of the book, there's this, this really you know, beautiful moving scene where the character is retracing her steps through Rome to kind of regain colors. But the only one that she can't get back is the color red. So throughout this, this book, she's constantly searching for it. And um, red is, is not only like, there's the kind of, you know, the obvious like connotation of, of blood like that is spilled, uh, like as a result of war and violence. But one important thing to note about um, Beyond Babylon in particular is I'm kind of uh, like, like Ellen was saying, the, the use of the use of humor is uh, like is a key component of the book. There are multiple sides to your experience. Life is not only trauma. So, the the color red in the book is not only your cue of some kind of pain here, but it's also so. Uh, Ijiaba is very concerned with the body. Um, this is a very kind of physical book. So not only what what damage is done to it, but how how it is a um, you know a conduit of 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 pleasure and joy too, and of kind of 
of self-understanding. And so, um, so soon after you have this scene like where she's lost, where one of the characters has lost her colors, there's also this scene like where she's talking about her, um, uh, her period, right? And, and this is something that comes up at multiple points throughout this book is trying to, to understand what this means to, to her, you know, as a woman. And um, this is not like, I don't want to spoil the book, but um, this, the meaning of blood and pain and pleasure, they all kind of have, you know, similar visual cues. So mm -hmm. that is one way that Ijiaba kind of moves around language to really capture what it means to, um, to undergo these experiences. I'll enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the language in Slash and Burn is, is very uh, straightforward and not, not often symbolic. And it, it, it might be worth mentioning that the word trauma is never used at any point in the book. Like, I'm assuming trauma. And the assumption comes from one scene that's almost at the very end where the protagonist's mother is dying and they've um, always had this tension over the daughter that the protagonist lost, who is, who's now in, in, in France. And that relationship is never mended. Um, and her mother is dying and she decides, the protagonist, again, no names, it makes it difficult to talk about, but the protagonist decides to um, go find her mother's wedding ring that she'd taken off during the war. Um, and she, this is sort of a journey through all of these sites of trauma, like all of these sites of, 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 of actual physical battle. And that is the only moment when this language starts becoming a bit more um, metaphoric. Um, like she, she goes to the the site where there used to be a doctor who would um, who would uh, give the women abortions because they didn't want women pregnant during the war. They wanted them fighting, and um, the doctor when she when he found out that she was pregnant, it was too late to do anything about it, and he helped her bring this baby into the world. And she always feels grateful, and she imagines his body in the earth um, feeding the trees. Um, and she goes, this protagonist goes, through, um, you, you, you follow her throughout the book and at no point does she really talk about pain or, you know, how it, it had affected her that she had almost been raped as a young girl. Um, it's only at the very end when she's talking to one of her, um, uh, friends who had also fought in the war. Um, I think the term is compañera in battle is what I uh, went for, um, where she doesn't have a mirror. So she, the, her friend serves as a mirror and she starts listing off every single one of her battle scars and starts remind, and like reminds her of the fact that she, can, she can't hear anything very well because she had been very close to, a bomb, to an explosive going off mm -hmm. and reminds her that she wakes up screaming in the middle of the night. And she had been so centered, the protagonist had been so centered on helping her daughters get ahead and recovering her lost daughter that she had completely blanked on any of the physical and emotional trauma that she herself had suffered um, throughout the war. Um, but when I think of language specifically, I'm always reminded of Paul Celan and the way that he sort of deconstructed the German and chose to write, write in German to start um, and then deconstructed the language and did something um, on the level on, on the level of like the syllabic components of the words. Um, so I guess it's not that trauma can't be expressed through language. It's just that you have to maybe shake up the the container and um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, it's interesting this question of language, and particularly in Snowman, because just as he clings to glasses of orange juice to salvage him and difficult situations, he also clings to words. And he, he writes about that. I, I've actually quickly found a place where he says, I was thinking trap, deception, loss. And quickly everything I saw became one of these words without resistance, without effort. And then I remembered the atlas. It appeared like a fourth word as atlas. 
at a moment when the others had replaced the world. And then he anchors himself in the word Atlas. Mm -hmm. And it's like he's clinging to these words to save him. It's, it's so in a way he's showing us by doing that, what the trauma, what the wordless part of trauma is like that, that he's reaching for words to pull him out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, also, oh, sorry, please. Um, he's also obsessed with precision. <laughs> At the very beginning, the word precise is all over the place. And then it sort of fades away. And then you start getting back. He's like craving precision, wondering if precision is even possible anymore. Um, and I think that has to also do with the loss of yes. language. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is true for, for many, uh, you know, cultures and locations, but uh, the Italian language is, uh, you know, it is a, a fundamental part of the way that Italians, uh, you know, view themselves, right? It, it, and uh, historically, um, it has been used in some cases, like as a way to uh, uh, distinguish between who was Italian and who was not Italian, right? Um, and so uh, if you go over to Italy now, actually like you and um, uh, like walk into a Black Lives Matter movement um, that is probably being led by a black Italian woman. Um, uh, there are, are some efforts to kind of uh, look at language, to look at the Italian language and see, all right, how do we, like, what words do we use to start talking about, you know, blackness and about white privilege? How do we translate that, right? And um, these, these activists are looking to, um, to the Black Lives Matter movement here in the US uh, to kind of see what, what terminology is being used and what's, like what's incredible about Italian is that the, the word for race, uh, razza, when you use that, uh, many people will think that you're talking about these, uh, you know, laws that the fascists passed um, like in the 1930s to talk about, uh, uh, you know, Jewish people and the kind of, uh, you know, prohibitions that were placed or that were imposed on Jews in Italy uh, be because of Mussolini, like in the fascists, right? So now in 2020, when you're talking about race in Italy, do you use razza or do you use like some other word to d describe like what you're talking about, right? So um, the fact that language is often like it's, I mean, it holds, you know, decades and, and kind of uh, uh, centuries worth of meaning, of connotations and experience. That is something that even today is being negotiated, not only within literature, but uh, like on the streets too. So since we're, I mean, we might just have time for one more question, but since we're talking so much about representation and I like, some of you brought up, like, for example, Erin, you talked about red or uh, Ellen, you talked about the glass of orange juice. I'm just really interested in kind of asking you about the relationship between the visual and the textual um, and kind of to what extent does, you know, a discussion of trauma rely on images? Um, and do you think trauma kind of needs to be expressed in a way that relies on the visual? Or do you think that it's even possible or either possible to like completely separate from the visual or that the visual offers something that te the textual representation mm -hmm. cannot offer. So kind of just thinking about the relationship between those two. Well, certainly the visual as it pertains to place is really important. I think that even if we don't know what the place is, still that sense of place is very mm -hmm. powerful in all three of these books. Yeah. Not necessarily a country as place, but just the physical surrounding of the characters and that it's a good question, but I'm not sure that any one thing that would apply to all three of these beyond that. Well, well one thing um, mm. that I'll mention is um, the kind of the, the you know, visual power of um, like images of, of protests um, 
the way that 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 actually translates across time is fascinating. So when I was working on Beyond Babylon, like I was aware of the scenes in Argentina where you had, you know, mothers and and grandmothers who would go to, you know, uh, uh, Plaza uh, de Mayo in in Buenos Aires and they would protest um, the, the state violence against those who were lost against um, uh, the, the disappeared, right? And there is something extremely potent about, well, nowadays too, about, you know, the images of mothers protesting and the, the kind of, um, the violence that th they are always forced to talk about, right? And so you see this image of, uh, of Argentinian, mothers like in the 1970s going to the plaza and you look at um, mothers t today like in the states who are losing you know their kids right that that um, like that image I think tr translates like really well and that's something that you see not only like in the U.S. now but uh, but all over the world so there is a way to um, to communicate like two other people, two other nations that you understand what tactics like they are using. Um, there's this this kind of you know visual grammar that is being shared across boundaries, which um, which I think is incredibly moving. Um, I think this is a half formed thought, <laughs> but um, I wonder if. I mean, I wonder if what, what the purpose of, I guess one question is what is the purpose of communicating the trauma? Um, so in what way can the visual be more effective? Um, are we trying to get people to do something? Are we trying to get people to understand? Um, if it's the latter, I, I keep thinking about a phrase in uh, Beyond Babylon where I can't remember which one of the characters it is. It might be Miriam essentially talking about how you how these things can never entirely be understood right like if if we if we're talking about you know literature as a creator of empathy maybe the empathy is only very superficial none of this will ever entirely be understood but we can pass down the knowledge mm. um and what literature can do is give people a glimpse of the interiority in a way that the visual can't and especially now when the visual images are all over the place, we're saturated with images, that maybe the, the, that space of quiet interiority that literature provides can actually be a more effective way of communicating. I mean, I, um, I, knew, I knew about the Civil War in El Salvador before I started translating this book because I'm South American. And so I knew what the CAA got up to in Latin America. I'd made it a point to know about that. Um, but I will never entirely understand um, what I translated, not in a visceral way, um, if that makes sense. I'm not sure that's an answer, half-formed thought. Excellent. So thank you, Ellen, Aaron, and Julia for the fascinating discussion. It was truly an honor um, and privilege for me to be able to moderate this conversation. And I think I'm gonna hand it over to Allison and Esther, who I see have appeared on the screen now. So much, Queenie. This was it, this is just such an important conversation to be having right now, and I I can't think of other people who I would rather hear listen to right now and to hear hear talk about about these this topic and your work with it. Um, so we do have some questions for you. Um, some of them are our own, I think. But uh, <laughs> um, the first question actually comes in from uh, Lara Vergneau, who herself wrote a really, an excellent essay on the experience of translating trauma, which has recently appeared on Words Without Borders. Um, her question is, can the panelists discuss mechanisms of self-care as they translate these difficult texts in terms of how their own mood or et cetera is affected by immersion in such dark themes? And, um, I think this is a really important question. And this is also Lena Munzer, whose uh, essay Esther referred to in the introduction, also sort of refers to that. And that was sort of one of the inspirations for the, the work that we're doing. I mean, and talking about this work that we're doing. And 
Did any of you have strategies for that? Nobody? <laughs> well, it's hard. <laughs> Were you there affected are many by it? I guess that's the... <laughs> Taking a break, <laughs> telling somebody about it, coming mm. back to it, uh, taking a deep breath, having a glass of wine, many, many, many strategies. Mm. Well, were you even, I mean, were you aware of it? I guess that's my, oh, my yes. question. I mean, what, as you're translating it, are you aware, aware even of how you yourself are sort of embodying the work that you're doing, the, the descriptions, the, the witness, the testimony? Well, if you're crying, for example, that's a hint. <laughs> that's a good tip <laughs> up, yes. Uh, but just physical tension. I just, sometimes I'll just like jump out of my chair and go do the laundry or something because I just need to do something to loosen up a little bit from the intensity of it. Mm. With this story with Beyond Babylon. So I, you know, what's, what's funny is that I, I can't exactly recall the, uh, like all of the emotions that I felt like when I first was, was translating the book partly because I was a, a college, you know, senior and I had a deadline to me. I was like, I need to actually like do the work. But when I returned to it, um, there are really, really harrowing scenes in the book that are, that I, like, I mean, of, you know, of awful things like that these characters experience. But the reason um, that I love the book so much is that I, I know, so the, there are, are like multiple, you know, uh, uh, sections of the book that switch between characters. With the last, uh, the last, you know, section, each time a a character's thread is over, it is so. I mean, it's so beautiful and often quite hopeful. Um, and so, knowing that these scenes are coming, <laughs> it kind of makes the process a little easier. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. because I know what end I'm translating toward. Um, that's that won't be the case for all books, and I I have worked on on, on stories and books um, where that's not the case. And uh, to to kind of take care of myself, I you know I'll, I'll translate a bit and then I'll put it away for maybe a week or two, like do something else, and then I'll come back to it. So, Julia, I I not very good at the self-care. I don't think, I'm like the protagonist. In the book. I don't really <laughs> notice what's wrong until my body feels very, very heavy and I need more sleep than usual. Um, but also this book, I also, by stick my head in the sand, um, I mean, that I, I just like get really deep into the words and I maybe just focus more on the, 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 the materiality of the words than I do about the bigger picture that, that sometimes helps. But this one, it felt long and laborious, but it didn't, it's, it's, it's the kind of book that sort of simmers, but doesn't boil over that much. Um, during the pandemic, I was translating a book that was truly harrowing. And my self care was to ask for like several extensions, <laughs> just so that I could get some space away from it because yeah, it was space. pandemic. And I was translating a book, another book about trauma. And I was like, oh, damn. Um, I have a question actually specifically for Ellen because you've also had this experience of interpreting, um, which is I, so- I didn't no. interpret. I worked with oh. interpreters, but I worked on tr translation of documents, not interpreting. But you've also written a lot about interpreting and, and, and work with interpreting. And I think that that must be a unique form of exposure to trauma because you're there, you know, with the person. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Well, it's interesting that you say that because at the War Crimes Tribunal where we worked, we had 150 people in the language unit. Half of them were interpreters, half of them were translators like me working on documentary translation for the documents tendered as evidence. And lots of people had issues with trauma in that work. But we had a really great uh, psychologist who was there to help people deal with these things. And one of the things that he said was that although interpreters are in the booth hearing everything live and speaking it, they speak it to other people. Mm 
So even though it's difficult, they have the option of being heard and there's a direct communication between them and the people in the courtroom. Whereas, and this relates to something Queenie had raised with us before, before this, with this secondary trauma, translators just sit with a document and then it just sits in you. There's nowhere to go with it. And even at the tribunal, there were confidentiality issues. We weren't allowed to speak about the documents we were working on with anyone except I was in charge of revising documents and editing and proofreading and so forth that other people had translated and I'd sort of go over to the translator and put my arm around them and say, well, that was, that was a rough one. But, but, but there was no other way for us to deal with it. And it, it does, it is difficult to deal with. Uh, and and it certainly, I think early on in the years of the tribunal when it was first starting and people were coming in with raw experience that hadn't had the benefit of some years between them and, and the events, that was also very difficult for the interpreters in the booth, obviously. Yeah, I think this is an important issue for, for translators. I mean, I'm, I, I, I guess one of the reasons that I thought Laura's question was important and this other question about interpreting too. I mean, I think because I, I myself happen to be working on a, a memoir that is traumatic and I'm finding, you know, and I'm working with the author and, you know, and this is her story and um, finding like that I need to like sort of think of it as a vortex that, uh, you know, that there's a vortex of her you know, her trauma and the story and I can step into it and then I can step out of it when I need to sort of make dinner or walk the dog or something like that so that I'm not necessarily like carrying, you know, this trauma in my own body all the time. Um, but I think there there was another question that um, Esther, like, well, the, the group when we were planning this conference, this subject, this topic was sort of always always something that we wanted to uh, highlight. And one of the things that um, came up as we were thinking about whom we might invite is like the idea of trauma, the gender with regard to trauma and testimony and thinking about it. And um, there was a point at which we wanted to make sure that it wasn't all women telling women's stories about trauma. And, um, it, I'm not sure if this is really a fully formed question, but I didn't know if any of you, Queenie, you included, to, if you wanted to sort of respond, because we, you can see we have um, men telling, you know, translating women's narratives and women t translating male narratives here. And so I think, would any of you have anything to speak to about gender and trauma? Um, I think what threw me to Slash and Burn was the fact that it was a narrative of war told from the perspective of women, which I don't think is very common. Um, as um, background reading, I read Svetlana Alexievich's The Unwomanly Face of War, um, which is the only other thing that I could find that um, talked about how women also participate in these very violent spaces. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's I mean, there's there's the possibility of sexual violence that comes up several times. I think those were the, the bits that I found most difficult to, to translate um, because I can relate more to the idea of sexual violence than I can relate to the idea of war, um, fortunately or no. Um, but I it also, it felt very comforting to be in a space that was predominantly female. Like it's mostly daughters. There are very few male characters. Mostly, they're uh, they're fleeting, um, and it somehow felt safer. Well, it's interesting that question because in the literatures that I work with, there were very few prominent women writers before this round of wars in the nineteen nineties. Just a few cases of strong women writers, and then suddenly. In 1990, just as the war was breaking out, a whole generation came forward. And so I've been really translating those women mostly. I didn't choose to <clears throat> bring their work to this just because this particular novel seems so well suited to the discussion. But, but it is now none of them were actually like Julia's characters describing being in a war. They were commentators, social cultural commentators uh, writing from a, a distance position, but still women have been the most important voices that have come out of Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, I think, uh, in the last 20 years. Mm. It's interesting. 
Yeah, and and uh, I, I like I never wanted to um, to like overstate my own role really. Like, but I think in 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 translating Ijiaba's work, I've always viewed that as an act of solidarity. Like, which I um, and it's uh, because you know, frankly, black women. Uh, everywhere have been seen as an as an underclass the the kind of last people to be considered in uh, a kind of cultural um uh imagination too and even today uh because of the the kind of long long legacy of you know of sexual violence against uh, black women in uh, um, uh, Italy and also in the colonies, um, like in the worst, the worst instances, you will have racist people come up to black Italian women and assume that they must be, uh, you know, prostitutes from um, uh, Nigeria, right? It, it, like it, this, this kind of lack of imagination, um, as to uh, the key role that black women have played in Italy's history, um, that uh, like that is something that Ijiaba and other writers like her are always addressing. And so um, I saw if there was a way that I could bring uh, like these stories, you know, into English for a wider audience, that I think was was my like small way of saying, I recognize like what you all are doing. I see it and I am so grateful for it. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, this, I, I wish we could honestly, I, I wish we could go on another hour. This has been so fascinating, um, but thank you all so much. And Queenie, uh, wonderful job. Thanks. Thanks. Allison, do you want to say a final, a final thank you to our sponsors? We would once again like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. We look forward to seeing you again next week and then for our big finale week of events. So please keep watching. Thank you. <laughs>